coming up on The Overcoming Life with Jimmy Evans. When you are in trouble, when you're, when you're battling depression, when you're battling sickness, when you're battling rebellion in your children, when you're battling financial problems, whatever you're battling, quote the Word of God over your circumstances. John 16, Jesus said, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus said, he'll lead you into all truth. There's nothing the Holy Spirit doesn't know. He knows everything. And so there are many times that we're challenged. We're making a decision. We're trying to figure something out. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be something related to the Bible. It can be math. It can be science. It can be homemaking. It can be plumbing. It can be anything. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all a double L truth. How does he lead us into truth? We go to him and say, I need, I need you to help me, Holy Spirit. I don't know this. I need you to help me to understand this. Okay. The manifestation, this is 1 Corinthians 12. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. To one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith through the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, that literally means deeds of power, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits. Listen to that one. The discerning of spirits is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to know if something is evil or not. To another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one as he wills. When God is, is distributing gifts, he distributes all of them. This is not to, for a few paid preachers. This is for every person in the body of Christ. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit, some of them are resident, but some of them are circumstantial. Some of us have resident gifts within our lives. But what this means is the Holy Spirit manifests the gifts of the Spirit, spiritual power, spiritual knowledge, the spiritual ability to speak and act, as we need it to live our lives to overcome the devil. The Holy Spirit changes our wanter, and it's one of the most beautiful things about the Holy Spirit. One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit listed in Galatians 5 is goodness. Goodness. Now, I think about my grandmother, Wells, or both my grandmothers, really. My grandmother, Wells, was just good, like Karen. Karen's just good. She's just, she was just a good person. But God is good above any other person, and here's, here's what good moral power means. I'm wrestling with sin, and when I'm wrestling with sin, what the Holy Spirit doesn't want to do is just give me the ability to not sin. He wants to change my desires. I don't want to live my life trying not to do something I really want to do. What, what a terrible life. I go to the Holy Spirit and I say, Holy Spirit, I want to do that. I want you to change my desires where I don't want to do that anymore. I want to live my life desiring the things that God wants me to desire. And so the Holy Spirit has moral power to keep us not just from sinning, but to get us to want to do what God wants us to do, to want the things of God. So when we're talking about power, that's it. Now the rest of this message is, is the specifics about walking in authority and power. And we're going to talk about the story of the 10 plagues of Egypt in Moses. Now this covers six chapters in the Bible, so I'm going to tell you a lot of this. But it's Exodus 7 through 12. And so you can go home and either read Exodus 7 or 12 or watch the movie, The Ten Commandments. Okay, you, you can decide what you want to do. There were 10 plagues, number one, 10 plagues. And here they went, they started yucky and turned out deadly. Okay, the first plagues were just yucky. The first plague in Exodus 7, the Nile turned into blood. Moses walked over, touched his rod to the water according to the commandment of God, and the Nile turned into blood. The second one, there's frogs everywhere which is yucky, yucky, frogs everywhere. Third was lice. Moses touched his rod against the ground and the dust became like lice all over Egypt. The fourth was flies, another super yucky plague. The next one was all the cattle died, okay? And this, this is when it began to be very serious. The sixth one were boils. Moses and Aaron threw ash up into the sky and all the Egyptian had boils on their body. The seventh was hail. Hail came from the sky, huge hail, and destroyed the crops. The next was locusts. Locusts filled the land, and whatever the hell didn't destroy, they ate up. The ninth plague was three days of total darkness. 
And the 10th plague was the death of the firstborn. That was the first Passover. And so those were the 10 plagues. All of the plagues that God brought to Egypt were judgments against their gods. But the Egyptians had many, many gods. An example of this is they had a god of the Nile named Hopi. And so when the Nile was judged, God was saying, I'm more powerful than your God. And by the way, the Egyptian magicians could do the first two plagues, but they couldn't do the next eight. And then the third plague, the magicians of Egypt came to Pharaoh and said, this is the hand of God. This is God judging us. They knew it. They also had a God who was the God of fertility and childbirth that was a frog named Hept. So when the frogs covered the land, this was another judgment of God on one of their gods. Ra was the sun god. So when the sky became black, he was judging Ra. They had a, a, a god in the form of a heifer named Hadhot. So when all the cows died, it was a judgment against Hadhot. And of course, Pharaoh was a god. So every plague that came to Egypt, what God was saying is, you have many gods, I'm one god. And I'm the God of the sky, I'm the God of the water, I'm the God of the land, I'm the God of everything. I transcend all your gods and I'm bigger than all your gods. It was literally God putting his finger in the, in the nose of, all, of Pharaoh and all of the Egyptians as he was also proving to the children of Israel his preeminence and his power. Pharaoh is a type of Satan and his response to the plagues revealed his satanic nature. Uh, Pharaoh was, was, was satanic. I mean, literally, his nature th all through the plagues was satanic. Four things he did through the plagues. Number one is he lied. Over and over, when a plague would break out, he said to Moses constantly, if you'll pray that the plague would be stopped, I'll let you go. Every time that, uh, that Moses stopped it, he went back on his word, hardened his heart, and he lied. The devil's a liar. He'll never tell you the truth. He overpromises and underdelivers every single time. Pharaoh is a liar, the devil's a liar. The number two thing that Pharaoh did was try to compromise with Moses. And as the plagues got more and more severe, they were saying, let my people go, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no, no, no. Then he begins to bargain with Moses and he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let your men go out into the wilderness to worship God, but the women and children stay here. Moses said, we all go or none of us go, and the plagues continue. So Pharaoh then comes back to bargain with him again and said, okay, I'll let the men, women, and children go, but your livestock has to stay here. And of course, they had to have their livestock to go do sacrifices. And Moses said, it's all or none. I'm not gonna bargain with you, Pharaoh. See, anything left in Egypt gave Pharaoh control. So finally, after the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh comes and says, get all of you, men, women, and children, get out of here. Of course, he changed his mind and tried to kill them again. But the point being, the devil will always try to get you to compromise because compromise gives him a foothold in your life. He doesn't want you to totally give up on sin. He doesn't want you to totally trust God. He wants you to believe that you can keep a foot in Egypt and a foot in the promised land and everything's gonna be all right. Understand this, a foot in Egypt means he has a level of control in our lives. Number three thing that Pharaoh did was pride. The Bible says he constantly hardened his heart and became proud uh, as the judgment continued. In fact, this is Exodus 10, three. It says, Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to him, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. Okay, how long will you, you know, uh, not humble yourself before me? Now this is Numbers 12, three. This is Moses wrote this now. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Moses wrote Numbers 12, three. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who are on the face of the earth. So Pharaoh is this hard-hearted, arrogant man. And it says that Moses was the most humble man on the earth. Now, of course, Moses wrote that, so that's kind of a strike against him. You know, when someone comes up to you and says, I am the most humble person I've ever met. <laughs> Probably somebody else should say that. Okay. But you know, while you're writing the Bible, you might as well go ahead and put a good word in for yourself. That's kind of my theory about it. Um, this is James 4, 6. God resists the proud. And the word resist there means to set yourself in battle formation against. This, the word resist there is not just kind of like this. When it says God resists the proud, it means he assembles his army against them. It doesn't mean he doesn't love us. It means God will never honor pride and he will never let pride succeed. In his love, he resists our pride because pride is always of the devil, but he gives grace to the humble. 
Well, let me say this to you. Every good thing in your life will always come when you're humble. And every bad thing in your life will always come when you're proud. It's the way it is. And the Bible says we clothe ourselves with humility. You know, when the Bible says, clothe yourselves with praise, clothe yourselves with truth, clothe yourselves with humility, you know what that means? We wake up without it. Our natural, our sin nature is to be proud. The only way you can be humble is to put it on. Every day you wake up and make a decision, I'm gonna walk in humility. But the devil's proud and he wants to infect us with pride so that we'll rebel against God. Number four thing that Pharaoh did was intimidation. He said to the children of Israel, I'm taking away your straw. You better make as many bricks though or I'll, I'll do whatever I have to do to keep you from rebelling against me. And he came to Moses and said, the next time you see my face, I'll kill you. And Moses said, you're right. I won't see your face again. You're gonna die. And so he tried to intimidate the children of Israel to keep them there. The devil tries to use fear to keep us in bondage. And 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power of power and of love and a sound mind. God hasn't given us this intimidated spirit, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Next issue in the 10 plagues is Israel was totally protected from all the plagues of Goshen. Not one of the plagues that hit Egypt hit Israel. And this is an interesting truth. The word Goshen, that's where, that's where the children of Israel lived in Egypt, okay? We were at the Egyptian Museum two years ago. I had a Muslim guide. She told me the children of Israel lived in Goshen. I asked her, I said, do y'all believe that Joseph and the children of Israel lived in Goshen? She said, well, of course, that's our history. They, they know they did. So the children of Israel lived in Goshen. The word Goshen means drawing near. Isn't that an interesting thing? And here's what James 4 says. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near. That's what the word Goshen means. Draw near. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now, I want you to listen to me. Just listen to what I'm saying. The children of Israel and Goshen, who are drawing near to God and his presence protected them, prove that the children of God can live in a land of judgment and be blessed. But the secret is to draw near to God and to live close to God. And the closeness of God in our lives also gives us the ability to pray for the redemption of our nation. But like never before, the people of God need to be close to God in the land of judgment. Have you felt overwhelmed by the challenges of life? The secret to overcoming stress and worry is living in God's presence. He'll guide you and help you overcome every negative emotion you experience. This series, Living in God's Presence, uses the life of Moses to show you how to possess your promised land and know God intimately. We wanna get this series into your hands and today we have an offer that will help take you deeper into your relationship with God. With your gift of any amount, we'll send you the Living in God's Presence series on CD or as an audio download. And with your gift of $50 or more, you can receive the Living in God's Presence series on DVD or as a video download. Plus, receive Jimmy's life-changing book, 10 Steps Towards Christ, a practical resource that will help you overcome old habits and mindsets in order to rely on God. You don't have to live with stress and anxiety. Start your journey of intimate friendship with God today. Now, there were 10 plagues, but not all of them were caused by the rod. Remember, God empowered the rod that he gave Moses, and he said, now you take that wherever you go, and I'm gonna do the miracles through that. But, but now he always had the rod with him, but only six of the plagues were caused by the rod. And I wanna talk about the four different ways that we exercise power and authority over the devil from the story here of Moses. Number one is our walk, our walk. Now, a rod is a walking stick. You know, if you're carrying a rod, you're using it to walk. It's a, a, an aid in walking. Six times, the, the plague of the Nile, the frogs, the lice, the hail, the locusts, and the darkness, uh, Moses used the cane or the rod uh, to, to affect those plagues, but only six times. The first way that we exercise authority over the devil is through our walk with God, just our walk. Now, this, this is not a trick question, but the, the question is, how did the children of Israel get out of Egypt? They walked out. How do we get out from under the dominion of the devil? We walk out. Every time you take a step of obedience to God, you're exercising authority over the devil in that area. This is Romans 6. 
Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You're God's slave or you're the devil's slave and there's nothing in between. And when we sin, I'm not talking about just every time we make a mistake, but I'm saying when we give ourselves to sin and live in a life of sin, we give the devil, even if we're on our way to heaven and God loves us, we still give the devil authority and power in that area of our lives. You say, well, how do I get out from under that? Obedience. Every time, when I walk by an offering container and I give in that offering container, what I'm saying is, devil, you're not gonna rule me in the area of my finances. I'm not gonna live in greed. I'm not gonna live in selfishness. I'm not gonna live in fear the way you used to keep me under control. I'm living by faith in the generosity and provision of God. I'm taking a step of obedience. Every time I get frustrated in my marriage and I'm tempted to do what I used to do, I decide I'm gonna love Karen regardless if she loves me or not because I'm not gonna walk in that selfishness and emotional bondage that he used to hold me in and go to bed and think of all these dark thoughts that I used to think. I'm gonna trust God that love never fails. And I'm gonna take a step of love. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for those who spitefully use me. I'm gonna bless those who curse me. I'm gonna submit to my boss whether he's nice or not. And every time I take a step, I'm taking a step out of Egypt. You walk out. How do you get out of Egypt? You walk out. One step at a time. Number two way that Moses exercised authority was our words, okay? Two of the plagues were caused by words. Twice, the plague of the flies and the plague of the cattle, God said to Moses, go tell Pharaoh, okay? Go tell, speak to Pharaoh. Don't use the rod, just go speak to Pharaoh and tell him this. Our words are incredibly powerful and important in exercising authority over the devil. In Matthew 4, the devil himself attacked Jesus in the wilderness when Jesus had been without food for 40 days. Think about it. Think about how weak you would be after 40 days without food. And the devil himself picks a fight with you after 40 days without food in the wilderness. You're all by yourself. You're as weak as you've ever been in your life. And Jesus defeated the devil by saying this three times. It is written. And Jesus spoke the word of God to Satan. I'm sure that he couldn't even hardly speak. He was so tired. But the point there is the word of God doesn't need our help. It is nuclear. When a child quotes a scripture, it will hemorrhage hell. The word of God is more powerful than anything we can understand. And by the way, when Moses was delivering Israel, not one thing he did was hard. Nothing he did was hard. God said, walk over and touch the Nile. And Moses walked over. Touch the ground. You know, Moses said, speak to Pharaoh. It's not hard. It just requires obedience. Here's what Hebrews 4 says about the word of God. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. When the Bible talks about swords, it's talking about warfare. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and joint of marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to him who must, we must give an account. And the point there is, when you are in trouble, when you're, when you're battling depression, when you're battling sickness, when you're battling rebellion in your children, when you're battling financial problems, whatever you're battling, quote the word of God over your circumstances. Don't stand around whining. Don't stand around complaining. Don't stand around as a parrot for what the devil wants you to say. Well, I've just always been broken. I guess I'll just never have any money. Well, I've just always had my lumbago. I tell you what, if my mother had it and I've got it and I bet my children are gonna have it. I just, well, just get over all that. Just put it. Say what God says over your circumstances. Take authority and power through God's word. That's what Moses did. And it judged Pharaoh and they were set free. Number three thing that, Pharaoh, that uh, Moses did was our warfare. God's, this was an interesting thing. God said to Moses and Aaron, I want you to go over to an oven, a furnace, and I want you to take ash out of that furnace and I want you to throw it in the air. And when they did, all the Egyptians had boils. Remember, the Egypt, Pharaoh is Satan. The Egyptians are demons. And the, the plague of the boils was caused as they went over and they reached into the oven 
took out the ash and threw it in the air. Well, remember, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. What is ash? Well, in this case, out of a furnace. It's the residue of fire. The only tangible evidence of a fire is ash, and it's completely pure. It represents the Holy Spirit, the evidence of the Holy Spirit. This is spiritual warfare. And the Lord says, Moses and Aaron, you go take your hands, and you take this ash, and you throw it up in the air. And when I do, the demon spirits will be judged. Here's what I want you to understand. God has given us the ability to bind and loose in the realm of the Spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 18, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. He also said it in Matthew 16. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. We have the ability through our spiritual warfare, through binding and loosing, to stop the enemy's activity in our lives and to loose the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. This is spiritual warfare. You throw ash up in the air and you declare that the environment of our home, the environment of our life will not be under the dominion of the devil. The environment around my life, the air around me is filled with the Spirit of God and I will not tolerate demonic agencies coming in and attacking my family, my health, my marriage, my children, anything in my life. I take authority over you, devil, and every demon in hell. And the last one is our weakness. Now this was an intro. This was the 10th play, okay? How do you exercise authority over the, your, over the devil? Your, your walk, your words, your warfare, your weakness. What does that mean? The children of Israel, the 10th plague, God came to the children of Israel and said to them, I want you to take a lamb, a one-year-old lamb, I want you to kill it. This is Jesus. This is the first Passover. Jesus died on Passover. I want you to take that lamb's blood and I want you to put it over the doorpost of the house because I'm going to kill all the firstborn tonight of Egypt. When I don't see that blood, I'm going to kill the firstborn of that house. So the children of Israel took a lamb and they took that blood and they wiped it over the doorpost of their house and they went inside and did nothing. They sat there. They were completely and totally disabled, trusting that blood. And here's what Revelation 12 says. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of God and the power of our Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. What does this mean? The devil is an accuser, and he's constantly accusing all of us. He's constantly telling us we're no good. He's constantly telling us God doesn't love us. He's constantly reminding us of our sins. He's constantly reminding us of all the things we've done wrong. And the only way to beat him at that game is to get under the blood and don't do one other thing. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. What does that mean? I know all the bad things I've done, devil, and I can't do one thing about it except the blood of Jesus has made me righteous before God. And I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to fight against you. I'm just staying right under the blood. And you can't touch me there, devil. I, in my weakness, the blood of Jesus has made me the righteousness of God in Christ. Let me, let me tell you a little secret, because I learned this many years ago. Every time the devil condemns you, begin to praise Jesus for his blood. And the devil will leave you alone, because he hates, he hates to hear about the blood of Jesus. It was the worst day he's ever had. Well, I hope you enjoyed the teaching today. I love this teaching because we all have our Egypt. We all have a place in our lives that you know, we're in that we're, we're not free. Uh, when I got saved, I think I was in bondage in every single area of my life, and I didn't know about freedom. I didn't know that it wasn't normal to live like that. In fact, the children of Israel had lived in Egypt for over 400 years. I mean, it's all they knew. And Moses came as a deliverer to the children of Israel in Egypt. Jesus came as our deliverer. And Moses came with authority. And every time there was a judgment uh, in Egypt, it was against one of their gods. And I'm saying this, Jesus came to judge the devil. And Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on the earth, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. In other words, before Jesus came, the devil had authority. The devil, remember when the devil was tempting Jesus, he took him to a high mountain and he said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you authority over the earth because I give it to whomever I wish for it was delivered to me, Adam and Eve. When they sinned, they delivered their authority over the devil. And this is the problem with sin 
it's not just acting against God's will, it's acting in agreement with the devil. And we, uh, we give him our authority. Here's the point. When we come to Jesus and we dedicate our lives to Jesus and we commit ourselves to him, and then with our walk, the way we live our lives, with our words, the way that we speak, with our warfare, our faith, that we have authority over the devil and with our weakness, grace, just coming to Jesus and praying for his grace. In those four ways, Moses defeated and judged every God of Egypt and the children of Israel, several million Israelis walked out of Egypt with the Egyptians' gold, remember, walked out of Egypt. And I'm saying to you right now, that through your walk, through your words, through your warfare, and through your weakness, in those four ways, just like Moses, God is going to take you into the promised land and judge every enemy that has come against your life. You're a child of God, your birthright is freedom and victory, and it's your time to overcome. The secret to overcoming stress and worry is living in God's presence. He'll guide you and help you overcome every challenge. In this powerful series, Living in God's Presence, Jimmy Evans will help you discover how to know God, the authority you have over the enemy, and how to possess your promised land. There's a rock following you, and his name is Jesus. And he'll be there for the rest of your life, and he'll always give you what you need. Support the overcoming life with your gift of any amount, and we'll send you the complete series, Living in God's Presence, on CD or audio download. Receive the complete series, Living in God's Presence, on DVD or video download, and Jimmy Evans' book, 10 Steps Towards Christ, for your gift of $50 or more. The 10 Steps Toward Christ book gives you practical steps to navigate your new life in Christ. The Lord will help you solve every problem, meet every need, and conquer every enemy. Receive this life-changing series today. Thank you for watching The Overcoming Life with Jimmy Evans.